Welcome uh, to an exciting episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I'm delighted to introduce you to RJ Grimshaw, who is an expert in business leadership, particularly focused on entrepreneurship. But RJ is also a CEO of a, a high growth uh, company, Unify Equipment Finance, grew from 13 million to 120 million uh, in revenue in six years. And uh, we, we'd love to hear from RJ, both on how you lead a business and innovate within an established business. RJ, welcome to the pod. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. And uh, I absolutely love talking about entrepreneurship as well as entrepreneurship because they really do run parallel to each other. Yeah. And, and I, I love love having you on because I think before becoming an entrepreneur myself, I definitely felt like an itch, right? Like that, that I needed to go and do something. People used to call me maverick because I would just try to kind of do things within larger organizations that were way beyond my, you know, my title or my level of responsibility and was in larger, you know, companies where success factors were eventually grew to, you know, be sold to SAP. I would kind of switch roles every couple of years to try to do some new initiatives. And so I felt strong affinity was that term of um, entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, not everybody that's entrepreneur needs to go and then eventually start their own business. So let's talk about, you know, what what is the impact that um, these very special people inside the enterprise, what, what sort of the most uh, common career paths for them? Because they don't necessarily, you know, always fit in the traditional path. And to me, they're like some of the most special people in our customers. So I want to make sure I help them and make their life you know rewarding when we collaborate with them so uh, describe to us the ter the term and you know who are the people that are thriving in that role sure well the the definition of uh, entrepreneurship is when an employee with an entrepreneurial spirit works within the confines of another business think of it as a business within a business the term typically or originally appeared in the early 1980s when management consultants Gifford and Elizabeth Pina published the book Entrepreneuring which uh, is the Bible of entrepreneurship. Um, and let me provide some insight in terms of when customers utilize this type of culture. We call it the iOS and not to rip off, you know, the real iOS, but iOS uh, is the entrepreneur operating system. And what we did at Unify with that mentality was what drove the growth. It wasn't RJ. It was the team and allowing the team or certain individuals within the organization to really take calculated risks. And that's one of the characteristics of an entrepreneur. Now, speaking of the individual, I would not be sitting here as a CEO president of Unify if I did not have that mentality. And my journey is quite different than yours, Alex. I actually started as an entrepreneur at a very young age. I was 23 years old, uh, just got out of the Air Force. And my dad, who was a very successful entrepreneur, his business plan actually hangs behind me. Uh, that he handwritten with two other partners in 1983. And they took this business plan from a plan to $50 million in revenue. Um, so again, my journey was opposite where I owned my own first business at a young age. And then I fell into corporate America when I turned 30 by accident. And really it was just an easy transition. And I never identified myself as an entrepreneur until probably early 2000s when I heard the term and I I self-identified and I said, yeah, this is what makes me successful. And, and I need to continue to uh, fuel that fire in my belly to do that. So I went from an individual contributor carrying a sales bag and a sales rep. Uh, and then within 13 years, multiple changes like you just mentioned. When I was with Key Equipment Finance for eight years, I went from carrying a bag to running a banking team, which I had no experience running a bank right. lending team at all. However, when I asked the district president, why would, why did he select me for that position? Primarily, it was because of my entrepreneurship mentality in terms of just the behaviors that I, I did. So, and keep in mind, the other thing is an entrepreneur, I have zero risk other than my time. I'm not outlaying any of my capital. So when you really truly look at the ROI of entrepreneuring and entrepreneuring, you, you really would have to mess up as an entrepreneur and not be successful because you're going to learn knowledge from being an entrepreneur right. you're going to have those experiences um, that you can take on the rest of your career with you 
Yeah, and I, I want to build on that because it it almost feels like there's this huge um, innovation wave in the smaller, young, you know, younger companies, right? And and in our company, it relates to we call it we are a company of founders. So my my co-founder ran his own startup beforehand, was the CEO. And then we just kept attracting other other founders to the team to build that spirit that you're describing. But it's a little bit easier uh, probably to find that in the startup ecosystem. But I think for for our customers, you know, that are kind of taking a risk, they're all, they are ultimately taking a bet. They're trying to do something new. They are not a blasé about their work. They feel like it means something. It, they feel like they want to do make a difference, make an impact. And so that's fundamentally human. That's the best of human characteristic. And so if you can de-risk some of that, but there's some risk, right? Like you, you're taking on a new initiative. It might fail, right? It might be, you might, in, you know, you may, you may still keep the, your job, but it's, it's, there, there is some risk, but it's, as you said, relatively de-risked, but I, I almost feel more importantly, it's, it gives your life more meaning if you're, but, if you're creating something, right? You're a part of the creator economy. And, and, and that proves out in uh, engagement surveys that we do within our mm -hmm. organization that run on the iOS. You see the, the level of engagement go up almost 15%. And right now, so many companies are struggling with just the engagement of employees and team members. Yeah. So when we do work with larger companies to deploy this, again, you see the discretionary effort. You see the engagement go up tremendously. And the reason why, the simple reason why is that these entrepreneurs and the team members of the team feel value because their voice is heard. They feel that they're adding value to the organization. So there has mm. to be alignment there between the entrepreneur and the mission vision of that founder. And if that aligns, it becomes extremely special. And and I, I guess in, in a small organization, you could ask uh, people to select out, right? So we, you know, we kind of have, like if you're, especially if you're, you know, relatively junior, uh, candidate, we give you a, a challenging task to figure out and work something out like that is a little bit unstructured, requires some resourcefulness, signals that this is not a place where you're just going to skate and put something in a resume, right? And and I think um, we even called it like in in the echo of intrapreneur term, as I was telling you earlier, we have a role, we call it internpreneur, and it's a it's a, one of the best things that we've come up with because it allows people that are either career changers, by the way, or or folks that are kind of very early in their career um, go and, you know, feel ownership over what they do. You know, some are some take a lot. Some 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 are kind of realizing that they need more structure, but it's also a good discovery. But at least they're drawn to that. Right. They wouldn't apply to this if they felt like this was. You know, they just want to kind of put something in the resume and, and you know, move on. So I like that a question. Do you actually advertise that term on your job descriptions? In terms That's right. Of yeah. For that role, for the role, we do it. And it's it's uh, it, and it, sometimes we forget and we say, oh, an intern. And I kind of keep reminding the team. No, no, no. They're intern for newers because it actually means a lot. It means that they can go and develop for themselves first and foremost take an ownership mindset, kind of deliver something, deliver value quickly. But, uh, you know, like we want, like I told you, hey, Zuckerberg started Facebook. He was in, you know, in college, you know, it doesn't matter, right? Like, like what, think like that. Why, why don't you think like that? And if you go and build something better afterwards, you know, a hundred times bigger than what we're building, then I already feel like as a CEO that I've actually had positive impact you know, if, even if you don't stay in our company and, you know, move on and explore, that's not a fit for you because you've I been would, endowed with that idea. Right. And I would assume that that probably gives you more sense of purpose than anything else. That when you see someone come through under your toolage and then become successful in the in the future down the line. Well, you know, it, de it differs in a business. So I'd say we've been pretty privileged to work on a very mission driven company itself. Mm -hmm. And I think as you're pointing out, the way you do it is just as important as the mission and ideally the two align. Our mission, you know, and, and we talked about it a little bit, we're reimagining the book, right? Mm -hmm. So this is like a, you know, civilizational project. And so I think I could get excited. I could be an asshole 
and some people say sometimes I am right yep. and still like be pretty far it up and still would people would love to work on this. Uh, you know, now I think to try to manage that part of me, you know, and and I create an, you know, more challenging and inspiring environment that's that's sort of not like that and sort of allows other people to step up and not be the 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 thing. But like if your mission is worthy, you know, you don't want to mess it up with the your execution around it. Right. And alienate it's people the, from the about delivering. I, I'd like to ask you, did you do you feel or does your team feel that by having the job description read that title and I haven't read it or I've seen it, but I'm, I applaud you for doing that. The caliber of the candidates has improved. Yeah. And I think, I think I, this is what we were discussing earlier in one of, uh, you know, with what I've read um, on one of your blogs, I, I think it has for you. Um, I, I think uh, the, the combination of that, a, and a pretty strict uh, execution requirements sort of weeds out. Like, I think there's a lot of people that aspire to be entrepreneurs, especially in their early in their career. Right. And, and if you have a, for example, let's say you have a part time thing, you're doing something in school and you're you're you know, you're doing something uh, with us. And we've noticed that some people kind of. Um, are optimistic about their ability to execute or their ability to ramp up or their ability to juggle a few balls effectively. And so I think it does get people, but some of them, you know, they, they either they can't commit, you know, or, or they just, just can't execute rapidly enough. So I think there is a, there's, but it's very quickly, we can figure that out very quickly. That's the beauty of it, right? Like you don't need to wait for, you know, for weeks, you kind of like, Hey, can't get stuff done. Um, you know, great. This is a good, good lesson for you, right? Like the, the, in the, in the operating environment, that's high demanding. You either, you need to bring, you know, bring points, points well, on board quickly. It's a dose of reality, especially if they're still in university and college, you know, yeah. it's a dose of reality, the way that the real world works in terms of you have to deliver value to the organization that you're joining. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think there's some, and, you know, I think that's a lesson that, somebody's got to give up. And I actually, interestingly, there's somebody that, um, you know, we, we, we've been running this for a few years. So there's somebody that basically we exited and they came back to me in a, in a gentle way for like explaining the, the rationale and, and everything. But it's like, they came back to me later. They kind of stay, stayed a fan of what we're doing. And they like, they clearly took on some of this messages and adapted their career. So I don't know what you're finding, but like when you're bringing people that, that kind of their, sense of themselves uh is a bit higher than the reality um in their how do you how do you help them grow right like like is it was it you make this grow within your organization um you know do do you feel like okay you 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 know you're not quite ready to be a real entrepreneur entrepreneur you know here's what you need to grow like i'm sure it's a ladder of some kind right yeah. I, I, I would I would expand on this and and I it was this is a true story that that happened within Unify. We had a gentleman who clearly was an entrepreneur. Clearly, he had all the signs, the characteristics, the behaviors of of being an entrepreneur. If you don't mind, I like to define those real quick for your audience to so at least try to self-identify within their organization. There's really five things to look for from a basic high level. Uh, perspective. It's really an ownership mentality of their responsibilities, which means they're held accountable and they're fine with that. They're a life learner. They're a person that's always mm -hmm. trying to learn uh, on a daily basis. They're passionate about life. It's just, they don't just show up, go through the motions, but they're passionate outside of work. They're passionate inside of work. They take calculated risks. Okay. So they are, they will take the risk, but it's going to be very calculated. And then they have a drive to spark change. It could be innovation. It could be improvement. A lot of the customers or cus companies that we work with, they want to start with innovation first because that's a catchy buzzword, innovate, innovate, innovate. A lot of times we say, let's start with improvement. Let, let, yeah. Let's have, a, have, a, have a, a, a plan and program set up where ideas can be shared by the people in the trenches because close to 38% uh, uh, of all employees feel they have great ideas to share. So you need to set up that mechanism. Um, however, I also want to say and, and make sure people are aware of this. You cannot, Alex, have a company of 100% entrepreneurs within your company. It, it won't work. Right. 
So what we there do all these we, all these new projects that never get completed. <laughs> there, there, there's absolutely no execution at all taking place. Yeah, okay? yeah. Everyone's in front of a little whiteboard all day, just drawing and and, yeah. and dreaming and envisioning. Yeah. So what we do is is we have a principle, you know, the 80-20 principle, and we define it as you need 80% of your team members or employees within your organization is functional. Okay, that's a level one employee. They show up every day, yeah. follow process, they have a good attitude, but you're never ever, they're never going to do anything more. As you transition to level two, they show signs of, of, of a becoming a vital employee and can create process once asked. However, they're never going to take that ownership mentality. And then the holy yeah. grail is what we call the, the vital level three. They show all the signs of an entrepreneur and they understand the inputs and the outputs to create systems and they solve problems to scale across departments. So there's a three, there's definitely a three different behaviors of those three different type of employees. And if I'm a founder in a startup and I'm going all in on this, I want to identify a level three to join me in my mission. And what we call that is co-missioning um, because yeah. at the end of the day, the biggest investment we all make is in the people that we're surrounding ourselves with. Yeah. Yeah, and I think ultimately the the sign of a great uh, founder or, or entrepreneur is that the ownership mindset will make them will make them complete things and get it done, but they can only do it for a X period of time, right? Like at some point they need that functional team to go and scale it, right? Because it's also like non scalable. Like if I yeah, I can execute. Yeah, I can follow up with every customer and prospect. But, you know, at some point, there's got to be a sales organization that like picks up on that or a marketing organization that nurtures that. Right. And so the that kind of um, approach seems to be um, missing because oftentimes in the startup literature, like, you know, it's all about like it's sort of a myth of the founder and everybody's a founder, blah, 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 blah. It's, but like, I, I really like what you've said. Like, you got to have a complement complementary team, but there's probably shared values. Yes. And that is what like some of like when you're starting to describe some of the values, right? Like lifelong learning. Like, I think that's exciting, right? That you want was people that believe that change is possible. You want you want you know, you want some of those characteristics. What do you think are kind of essential values, if not of an entrepreneur, that are a person that would succeed in an organization that wants to move, right? That wants to progress. What's like, what's one or two of those values that are a must have? You know, I, I would say from a value perspective, um, it, it, one of the main values is that they're, you know, they're trustworthy, uh, they're a good communicator, and I don't know if that's behaviors or values, um, but in the same respect, it's someone that, you know, there's always a simple rule of thumb that I've always used when hiring people, and it's a simple principle of, would I go to dinner with this person and enjoy a couple hours of dinner with them? And if the answer is yes, then I want, you know, that's one of the barriers um, another thing that I ask again, uh, and I'm not asking your question specifically, but it's again, trying to pull out signs that someone could be an entrepreneur is a question I always personally ask uh, every candidate that comes to unify is if money was not an object, what would your dream job be? And I'll go first. And the answer isn't to come to work for unify because that's not my answer as a CEO president. So it shouldn't be yours either. My dream job would be, I'd be the coach of the university of Michigan's football team or hockey team. I, I love coaching. I love athletics. I love competing. Um, that's another value. They have a high competition. You know, they have a high compete rate. And typically you get those out of athletes. So we love hiring athletes that come out of a team sport environment because they have discipline, they have um, work ethic, they understand team in a high compete level. So, um, the, and, then I'll, I'll, and then I'll ask them. And Alex, there's been people that I've thought through the whole interview, there's now nah, they're not a good fit. They've answered that question in a certain way, and I've hired them. There's been other people that have come through interview, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is great, and then they and then they answer it, and you know, obviously, it just doesn't come down to that one question, but that question does wear on or, or have value in the overall um, because that's really you're speaking to their heart, and they're giving you a real answer, not a calculated answer, because they're taken off guard by it. I've also had people start crying. You know, they 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 usually uh, there's an event maybe in their family and, you know, someone passed away from cancer or something and they right. want to start a foundation and do that. So it, it's a it hit, it hit home, you know, it hits home, um, you know, but again, it, it's trying to extrapolate 
the, from the person, um, because at the end of the day, we're what all really people. matters to them. What really, what's, yeah. what's, what's at the, what's at the heart. Yeah. And that just works for RJ, but I, but I love what you're doing again with your job description for your entrepreneur, your internpreneurs. I got to learn that word. That's a new one for me <laughs> because we help companies actually just tweak that on their job description. And as you said, the blog that I've written and we have data behind this, you'll see the quality of your candidates go up tremendously. However, you have to be on the guard because you want to ensure the downside with entrepreneurs is that maybe they'll get out in front over their skis a little bit and you have yeah. to rein them back in. Yeah, I, th I think like just weighing in on some of these questions of, in the interviews, right? Because I think the, that sort of is a, an important dimension of of kind of getting people into the right role. Sometimes you're going to be, you have a, you know, you have a great candidate and they, f they may have technical expertise in your domain. Um, but, you know, do, do you put them in a role that's structured or the role that's unstructured? Right. And, you know, like do you, that's sort of one, one sort of question, uh, you know, echoes, uh, I think what, one of the legendary questions, uh, <laughs> from from my alma mater when they when you're when i was applying to an aba program they, they the the question which was the bulk of the application essay is what matters most to you and why and believe it or not um the question and it was very different than any pretty much any other mba uh questions and people would still go back to the answer that they wrote not just throughout their mba <laughs> program right sharing it was their uh, you know classmates they go back and reflect on that five ten x years after um you know afterwards because it's sort of it it does force you to be specific it does force you to reflect and and i think I, i'm grateful to the institution for doing that right and mm -hmm. so I, I wonder like when you know have you done things in your recruiting process uh that also just force people to you know even, even if they don't join you right like but but like leave some sort of positive impact in them because when i think about it right we want to leave our customers better but we also want to leave our prospects in a better off we like even if we're not a right fit you're still a good human being we want to thank you for taking the time to investigate what we are up to you know who knows maybe we'll meet again but we want to create value experience right obviously customers um, but you know, same with employees, right? Like you obviously want to create value for your team, but what about all the people that don't make it through, through the lens? And I worry about that, right? Because we, you have to say no. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, how, how have you found, you know, was, was kind of particularly was the lens of the sort of intra, in, in, intrapreneur, mm -hmm. um, and high growth organization in a relatively mature industry, right? Like, which is oh, sort yeah. of even more impressive, um, how did you find like to select out those people and then, you know, let the, the ones that didn't make it know why? And typically I would always tell candidates if for some reason from our filter, I love the way that you frame that and position it, um, that it's probably us and not them. Um, right. They just don't fit into who we are. And I would always say we're, we're unique because um, Unify actually started in 1978. So when I came into the organization in 2013, it was a well-established organization. And I was the second president CEO of the company to jumpstart it again. So I had a lot of legacy employees, which really were the drove the success that we had. The good news though, Alex, is when you deploy an iOS operating system within your company, the entrepreneur operating system, you're going to reduce your turnover because people are, again, back to engagement and they feel their value and they don't want right, to leave right. the company. So it really actually reduces your turnover considerably. We had a company that was had all kinds of turnover. We went in, deployed this, and within two years, they decreased their turnover 87%. Just, and just, again, to summarize for our audience, the value is that I am leaving a legacy, right? I am creating something. I am part of the creation machine. I'm not just doing a job. Um, it, do you get ever get to the stage where people feel like it's their calling or it's just that I really love my job? So I'm very privileged to be working, at, you know, and I shaped it. It's not an accident. Right. I wanted to write books. I knew I didn't have any talent as a writer, but I can kind of help others create, you know, more engaging and 
you know, reimagine the book. So I was kind of I'm geeking out like that. I wanted to marry a French girl. I ended up marrying a French girl. So I've been like very deliberate, you know, in my kind of sh shaping my life to fit into some sort of well, however rightly or wrongly kind of set of values. Now, not everybody can do this. And I wasn't able to do it at times either. So I'm really curious you know what for people like you said they've discovered this other their passion is not you're you you would rather be coaching you know uh you michigan hockey team and you know making them you know hit you know <laughs> be where the puck is going to be right like you know do do that thing more so and and, and tell i tell me how do you how do you how do you make combine it right that's like, a wonderful question because i i always i also say my second job or my my other dream job probably would have been a gym teacher in high school, coaching high school football or hockey, but that didn't compensate me for the lifestyle that I wanted to live. So mm -hmm. that's where you have to make a, a, a adjustment where what is going to get to get what vehicle get to get me to where I want to go. All right. And I firmly believe in everything you're saying, Alex, in terms of what is your North Star? What are you trying to get to? And when I fell into corporate America and I was working with businesses financing their equipment, it filled that void of not being my own entrepreneur because I was still in the trenches with them and I could add value to those relationships from my experiences. Um, Got it. No, so you're basically has... it's a combination of like, look, you have other values, right? Like you mm -hmm. got to take care of your family. You have, you know, you have to want to see the world explore like there is like not everybody is independently wealthy and can do whatever they they want right like you know we are where we are uh and so what you're training is like within the constraints of you know maybe the the company that i'm in the industry that i'm in the job that i'm in how do i make that to be the most co-creative innovative like the you know positive experience that makes me feel connected to the mission and actually influence the mission. Yeah. And that has, that alignment has to be there truly for an entrepreneur, that alignment has to be there. If you're a vital employee, you have to believe in the mission and the vision and the values of the organization or it just won't work. And it's easy enough to go seek and find that. And the other thing that I'm trying to do, Alex, is really educate people to self-identify of an entrepreneur. So they understand the value and then they can be compensated for that value accordingly. OK, because it's you know, they have a more robust job performance. They increase the organization commitment and things of that nature. And they should be proud of that. And they should be compensated accordingly because we all know what happens. Right. As a business owner, as a CEO, you're always going to continue to squeeze more and more production or more and more value out of your entrepreneurs or your high vital employees. So why shouldn't they self-reflect and self-discover and identify as that and understand the true value that they are bringing to the organization? And I have an example of that. I hired yeah. a, a lady out of uh, the Detroit Red Wings. She was she worked for the Red Wings for eight years. She was referred to me by another friend through LinkedIn. I thought, why would this lady want to come to Unify? She works for the Red Wings. I mean, that, that's the coolest job. You want to work for the you want to work for the Red work. Wings. <laughs> it was top roles, okay? But she was burnt out. Very demanding job, very demanding for eight years. So we interviewed her. And, and this also plays into the question you asked before around maybe she didn't pass the lens or the candidate didn't pass through the proper lens the first time. But we she came through. For some reason, it wasn't a fit, but she continued to follow up with me and stay in touch with me. And not just, hey, I'm following up, but hey, I saw this article and I thought of you, or I thought this would be relevant to you, or congratulations if we had a press release. Ultimately, we hired her as my executive assistant. Mm -hmm. And she came in and within three years, she went being my executive assistant to running the portfolio on the back end of the business, just because of her, she was an entrepreneur. She is an entrepreneur through yeah. and through. She owned everything. She took calculated risk. And then every day, her main mission was to make the company better because she believed in how we were serving our customers. And again, it aligned with her mission and vision. Well, so we talked and a lot about internal, right? And this is actually, but you brought up the word customer. And this is a word that's near and dear to my heart. So I, I think the, the risk for most companies as they become successful, as they go a little bit further away from their customer, right? And some of our clients, uh, they have these sort of innovation, you know, initiatives, right? And they, they, 
And so that's how we got to so like working with very large in, 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 in organizations. Um, you, you know, you, they, they want to be a peer innovative to their customers. And so they create these internal innovation teams and some people that are on the cynical side, you know, rather, you know, maybe some, some English chat would say, what well, it's a bit of Alex, you know, it's a bit of innovation theater, you know, that, <laughs> that we're engaging in here. So it's some sort of a kabuki thing where we pretend like we're innovating, you know, and, and you know, we, you know, we pretend like we'll implement something with startups. And so we saw, we got, we got pulled into some of that. We found some amazing people and we found a lot of people that were, Doing a, like they they had to get stuff done internally, uh, but the ones that were the most impactful were the ones that actually were really customer centric. So they they could get stuff done internally. That was a prerequisite for working within some of these larger organizations. Um, but you kind of need to to be you know get get access somehow and get you know get that mindset of like wear the customer shoes you know on, on a more regular basis. And the larger the company, the harder that becomes. By all so means. How do how do how do entrepreneurs kind of avoid the theater part and really like get something done and become that voice of the customer in 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 larger institutions? Specifically in larger institutions, if the if you have that iOS system set up where ideas are being shared in a format that's being you know um, calculated and reviewed and things of that nature. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 38% of all employees believe they have great ideas because they're working with the customer on a daily basis. The CEO isn't, you're not, yeah. they are. So if you have a vehicle where they can share that feedback and share those ideas, right. there's been a recent survey by Bain and company that found the companies with an entrepreneur culture had a 30% higher net promoter score. Yeah. So again, it, it, it's the right mindset. And even e this is a key, key point here, Alex, even if I spoke earlier about the 80-20 rule, where you're functional and vital, even if the functional or just functional, which we want them, but you have an entrepreneurial culture within your organization, you're yeah. going to start seeing the functional with ideas because now they 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 can they know that their voice is heard. They know that they're not going to be um, ridiculed with their ideas or it's going to go um, unheard uh, or, or not valued. So you see discretionary effort even from your functional employees as well. Yeah, and by the way, we we incur, we actively solicit that, and we find that, uh, like, let's say I'm still junior junior team member, but I'm working on something very specific, and if I'm able to pull up and see how that specific thing impacts our customers in the either positive way, so we need to amplify it, or a negative way, so we need to address it. They are closer sometimes, given their functional role, they're closer to the to the actual nuts and bolts of what people may do with a product or with a service. And, you know, because of the larger number, they are also the ones that are in touch with the most number of customers most frequently. Right. So they are essential, you know, and if you can imbue everybody with that feeling, to your point, because it's a culture that's reinforced. It, it, it's um, some sometimes, you know, I could dream up a great customer idea, but I'm not the one that's dealing with the painful problem uh, on a day to day basis. Right. Right. I completely agree with that. Um, and we have blind spots uh, as leaders. You know, a lot of times we're, you know, again, back to, you know, we're thinking about different things. We're worried like right now I'm worried about 2024 with a financial plan and the draft and things of that nature. And we we're not as close to it as you just mentioned. And then we just have a blind spot to it. I'll give you an example of that. At Unify, one of our salesmen, again, this, he, he was an entrepreneur through and through, an attorney by trade, he had his law degree, came to me and said, RJ, I really think we need to build out an online portal to receive payments. And um, I said, well, tell me more. He said, well, you know, he gave me some data points. And all entrepreneurs are typically well documented and educated before they come and present an idea that's of significance okay mm -hmm. and i said to him i said if you want to run with it you're going to have to influence our it department you're also going to have to influence the outside provider um and you're also going to have to continue your you know your sales production he said i want to take it on i, I i'm going to learn from it and he's tech savvy well lo and behold he built this out in 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 three months 90 days today 
today, we went from zero. We did not have that as a product or a function within the organization. Today, we process over $100,000 of monthly payments through that portal. And it was not in his job job description. It wasn't, it wasn't, he wasn't compensated for it, but he understood that from my philosophy and my culture, we're all about the customer. And he took the lead on that. So I I love it because it basically says that like no initiative is too small to be an owner, right? Like, like any, like this is, this is not a, this is a valuable, it's not like a total game changer, but you know, for the business, but it's valuable. It creates meaning for them and that's already valuable. It creates a momentum improvement. So one thing that you brought up is like presenting, com- communicating. So I feel like one of the biggest tragedies that I see in the world, but particularly in the corporate, you know, global 2000 universe that, you know, we often live in is that these innovation teams uh, like talk a lot about, we're going to do digital transformation, right? We're going to do this. They hire Bain, you know, like, you know, and say Bain and us, we work through on digital transformation. Here's a 200 page, you know, paper optimized PDF report on how we're going to do this digital transformation. And now, like, if somebody wants to read that in, like, in, in paper, right, by all means, right? that's actually great. Gonna you know, people I'm, I'm going I'm to the just, and say, give me the five bullet points that I can take away from this document. Yeah, or like something like show me, like help me imagine it. Help me like show me the 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 customer story. Walk me through that, or let me drill in. Right, like I I I think um um one of the lessons I learned uh, at Microsoft was just the stories of like of uh, Bill Gates. Um, as a manager, he would like he would take hear the overall presentation, but then he would go and drill in, right? And and but he would, he doesn't need to go through every page of everything, but by drilling in. He kind of understood, have you guys thought this through? Have you, you know, do you have a high level strategy and overview, but then do you have the supporting evidence? And that's how a lot of leaders think, right? Like, I, I don't need to hear your whole 200 page spiel, but I don't mind, you know, getting the high level summary and the saying, hey, this is likely an interesting area or troubled area or the one that's not obvious. Let's drill in here. The problem is I don't think um, a lot of the innovation or entrepreneur projects are presented in the, in that way um and so a lot of them never get take never get started and they lose you know if you're introducing digital uh digital transformation on paper for or you're selling you know sustainability on you know on the couple of trees that you killed you're just not credible like of from the gates right and, and i think that just uh, kind of uh, it seems ironic to me. Maybe I'm too focused on this because I'm a little bit in this world, but I'm curious what's your opinion on kind of being congruent, right? The messenger, the message, the delivery, you know, do they align and how important is that? It's critical. And the worst thing that you can do is, is um, start vocalizing, communicating that you're open to ideas and, and you're, 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 you know, building this culture and education. That's what we do. We educate the employee. We educate the management team around this system and you roll it out. And we always tell our customers, it's not going to happen overnight. You don't go to the gym one time, work out and you have muscles. The same thing. If you go on a prescription from your doctor, you don't take it one time and you're fixed. You have to be, you have to have, especially if it's antibiotic, right? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So it's, it's more of a, a journey. And yeah. I actually tell business owners, if you aren't committed to this to for a minimum 12 to 18 months, don't do it. Please don't do it because you're actually setting yourself up for more failure. You're actually going to hurt your level of engagement and your employees. You're going to have more turnover. But if you are committed, you have to commit it, commit to it for 18 months, 12 to 18 months. And when you do that, that's where we set up that vehicle where that communication and we have stack rankings of ideas. And as long as people, even if it's a, ter- we've, believe me, we've had really crazy ideas that have come to us. And as long as the employee, you go back to the employee and this takes time. And this is where leaders are challenged. You know, the most you know valuable asset we have is our time and explain to them why it doesn't fit because it's an education piece. All right. And then you allow them just to make the simple changes. Again, Alex, we like to start small before we go big with the, you know, the, the in, in, innovating. So start with the small ideas, basic improvement, 
And again, the benefits of that, you're going to get higher engagement. You're going to get higher discretionary effort. You're going to get a culture that is more open, trustworthy, and things of that nature. The other thing you're going to do is weed out your people that you quickly can identify as not team players because they won't buy in. They will not buy in. And you can quickly say, okay, you know, they're they're not part of this team long term. Right. No, that make let's let, let that makes a lot of sense, but l- let's drill into one area that I think is very real for a lot of folks. So you're kind of you've created excitement. We're like we're inclusive culture. We get we love ideas from everyone, right? And I show up with an idea, right? And I think obviously <laughs> you my idea is great. <laughs> you know, like and I think most people do. In fact, like I think one of the reasons why we started relate to was like i was like hey my ideas for some reason are not winning in some some conversations like it can't be because i am a you know i'm not particularly brilliant you know whatever like at least i'm talking of myself like in my 20s or something like that right uh so um something is like it's, these people look like they're pretty smart so i need to figure something out like it was sort of um the sort of disconnect right so people don't think that their ideas suck by by definition right uh, and and so they show up and then their idea doesn't get chosen for good reasons, right? Like reasons could be that you need to prioritize, right? There is like, right. there is a matrix of some sort of uh, how you select them. Um, but it, what do you say to that feeling that like, oh, you know, it, it's not my thing, right? Like, and I actually wanted to do something different. And, you know, why is, you know, that person's idea better than mine? Right. And yeah, I'll eat, I'll do it for the team. But is there like, do you find this sort of resentment that builds up if your idea doesn't get picked up a couple of times? You know, that, that could be, it, it could be, but it, it's really where you start the program where, you know, it, it, you have to have the why behind why you're deploying this type of culture and then the business goal and then how it plays. We have a waterfall where the business goal pulls, pull, plays into the strategic initiative to the objective of the program and then the metrics. So we can't pick 15 different ideas. Right. Typically we say pick one or two, again, get wins, get momentum behind that and clearly identify that. And then you have the measurement around that in terms of capturing it, managing it, putting it on a short list, implementing it, engaging, and then analyzing it. Because there's been ideas too, Alex, that we've deployed that were complete flops, but that's okay because we learn from that. Right. We're okay. We under we have that yeah. we have that in our in our in our mind in our business plan. We're twenty percent of ideas that will flop, and we're okay with that because again, yeah, back and to it's my- a very it's a very important point, right? Like, and I think it's almost so. I have a twelve year old who you know has been doing you know well academically, and now has had her first like hiccup, and it's tough. It's a, it's like it's a mentally kind of. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great learning, right? But it's just a, a kind of an adjustment like, oh, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be kind of fitting into that perfection mode. And I I think, you know, I as in like somebody who's an entrepreneur who like fails, you know, on a regular basis and encourages it, I get it, right? But I think me in my corporate America or corporate Europe hat, you know, I was a little bit more probably conservative on that failure right like and there was a big adjust especially if you're kind of done well academically you know and kind of have you know pleased your parents with high marks and credentials and all that and you're that's your personality and then you hit reality of the market um and all of a sudden there's disappointments and and things don't work so how do you help people who are not quite there yet in terms of accepting failure and learning from failure and even almost celebrating that okay we failed on this uh and you know you don't want to celebrate failure too much because you still no. want to win more often than not so it's sort of a tricky balance because people are like oh yeah i failed good job well maybe you failed because you didn't like do basic customer research <laughs> you know like that's not a good reason to fail right like oh, i failed fast well okay still you wasted a bunch of you know, either company time. or investor resources or people's time so you don't want to be like, oh, great, I'm failed, you know, get another star, right? It's not like that. You, but at the same time, you don't want to be discouraging people from taking on things. And like, what's your take on this? And not, like, you may have a portfolio across the company, right? And a VC may have a portfolio across a ton of startups, 
But as an entrepreneur and like entrepreneur, they don't have a portfolio like as like their startup needs to work. Right. And the, their project kind of needs to work because that's their like they probably have one, maybe two initiatives. And so I don't know if there is there a, kind of a, a pattern that you found around this. There, there is, and it's really, you know, where where the business is in life life cycle, right? Is it a start, is a pre rev startup, post rev commercial, growing, mm-hmm. scaling, and I think that the entrepreneur in all those situations play a different role. Okay, so um, you you can't have, um, and again, that's where the co missioning comes together. But if you are truly a startup. And you're trying to surround yourself with the best of the best in terms of you, you're going all in on this idea. So you're risking a lot. Why wouldn't you want to identify an entrepreneur that's going to have a co-ownership mentality to help you be successful? You would, I would want that on my team. Yeah, absolutely. By, by, by all means. Now, I also want to say, Alex, it's very critical. And, and we've seen this before where we roll it out and all of a sudden, People within the organization feel they're overwhelmed. Oh, we're being asked to do something else. Oh, you know, what, yeah. what's what's yeah. in it for me? Um, and that's where the education comes. What what's in it for them if they want to participate and self-identify that they're going to have more, you know, a work satisfaction, things of that nature, and helping the overall organization um, as well as serving the customer. So it's really each business owner and leader in their company they have to craft it to their culture. It's not a peanut butter approach where it makes sense for everyone. And again, you know, they have to identify what is going to resonate with their team. Right. And the risk profile, I guess what you're saying is the risk profile varies by stage of the business, which makes sense, right? Like you can't, you know, I I think, although I will say like some, at least in the technology industry where I'm biased by bulk of my experience, not necessarily our customers, but like you have to make bold bets, even if you're a large company. Um, but I think in some other industries, I think it's more of a portfolio uh, strategy that could actually, you know, hey, we do a bunch of things really well and they add up to some some magical um, outcomes. So it, it's it's not, it's sort of, I think it also varies a bit by the industry, uh, competitive nature, competitive nature of the industry, I would imagine. But you can also seek feedback. And we did this at Unify in 2016, where we went out and said, we really want to identify who we are, what our personality is. Because when you grow like we did in in 14 and 15 and 16, the metaphor I use is we're a restaurant. We found a good location. We wanted we wanted cash flow. We wanted people coming in. So it didn't matter what they ordered, Alex. They could order a steak. If we didn't have it, we run to the store, cook the steak. If they wanted pasta, they could order sushi, Thai. It didn't matter. We were good location, good atmosphere. However, we can never scale it like that. So we had to make an educated decision. And that's where working with the team of who we are, where do we want to go, and who are we going to say no to? Because we can't serve all. And by serving all, we're actually hurting the value that we bring. So we became a steak shop. And then as soon as we made that pivot, that's where the business went to the next level because we went again from 13 to 35 to 74. We kind of stagnated around 80 for a little bit. Then we went to a hundred when we made that decision because we could scale it and we, we were self-identifying. And again, the team had a voice in that. It wasn't RJ. It wasn't the leadership team. It was all of us combined because they are dealing with the customers every day. They know the filter that to understand the growth and things of that nature. So if I connect the dots and kind of some of the themes, so so in entrepreneurs have a distinct um, nose for delivering a customer outcome because ultimately every business initiative kind of whether it's internal customer external, they so they're kind of they come with the sort of customer ownership mindset, and then you in the process you create the environment that's more yeah. creates a great cultural employee and team member experience that makes people feel like this is this is worthwhile of the sacrifices and the extra investment the extra love that they need to put in the business because it's sort of anything that you put more of your heart into is is also more meaningful to you right and and the outcome is more likely to be successful your kids it, are it, hard but you put love into them and it, it, uh, <laughs> they don't look at it. And that's the other beautiful thing about an entrepreneur. They don't look at it from a monetary perspective. Okay. And that's why I'm trying to educate them. That they should be. They're doing it yeah. because they, they love what they do. An example exactly. of that is, you know, 
college athletes, I'll use them as an example, but they're paid now too. You know, as their season goes on and they make it to the playoffs and the championship or NFL football, guess what? That that they didn't sign up for that at the beginning of the season. Now they're playing action. Do they care? No, because they want to win and compete and have the glory at the end. An entrepreneur thinks the same way. They want the glory of seeing this business owner, this entrepreneur be successful as well as their customers be successful. So there's other motivating factors for the entrepreneur than just, you know, higher compensation um, and things of that nature. Well, the more I hear you, the more I think entrepreneurs are just wonderful human beings and uh, well, we want more. We want more of them. Uh, so I, I, if you're if you have a budding entrepreneur, come out. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I, they're, they're, you know, I, I painted all the positives. The, the, yeah. the negative side of it is the gentleman that I brought up that that um, built the portal for us. He ultimately left because I could not fulfill his needs of more initiatives. So that is a downside because, they're, again, they're life learners. They're passionate. They, they, they take calculator risk takers and he used his experience to go obtain a better job for him. And I applaud that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, but that's the thing. I think you and I, we agree that that's actually, that is a, you know, now that is a testament to you as a leader, right? A great leader is not somebody who leads. A great leader is who helps others become leaders. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, I think that is, um, also something that a great entrepreneur does, right? Mm -hmm. Because they lead their team and they may lose their, their team, but that's life because people want to be the sort of a magnet, be known as a magnet where people come and join you and, and, you know, they, they learn and they do great things. And, you know, that's why you're a coach, right? Like that you love coaching, right? Like you're, this is your dream job. And effectively, I think what you're telling us is that you are doing your dream job. It's just not, in the in the field of um, University of Michigan uh, football team, <laughs> it's just in the field of you know people doing things in their job, and I think that's amazing. I I don't know, like call me, um, call me like overly enthusiastic, but I I, I think that's uh, that's a that's a great sign of somebody who inspires others through your example, through the structure that you do. Sometimes not for your example. I need to tell people, hey, don't do what I do here. This is me improvising, right? Like you really, you know, you're not, this is not sure it's the best. And anyway, it's hard to imitate. You right? and I, you and I are aware of the same way because I'll tell my sales guys a lot of times, they'll come ask me for my opinion. And of course I'll give it and I'll say, but that's the way that RJ does it. Yeah. Doesn't mean you have to do it like that. You and and I'm always coaching them. You should take attributes from individuals that you come in contact with to build out your personality, which has yeah. to be your own individual personality, but just don't take someone and just repeat them because it's not from, it's not authentic. It's not from the heart. And yeah. one last example, everyone's very familiar with the EOS operating system by track with traction and things of that nature. And here's a real easy way to remember what an entrepreneur is in the EOS system, the visionary, the entrepreneur, the idea guy or gal, they're here. The implementer in the EOS system comes along next to them and co-missions. This is your entrepreneur. Implementers are all of them are entrepreneurs. They're wired like entrepreneurs and they make the dreams or they're the doers to make the dream happen for the visionary. And it's it, they're doers um, and they're typically very good operators. And again, back to the risk question you asked earlier the entrepreneurs that we work with, and there's a lot of data and science out there that we've studied are very calculated with their risk taking. Hence why they're not entrepreneurs. So yeah. sometimes they they look at spending the money like it's their own money and understand, like I said earlier about level three, they understand the inputs, the outputs and what it does for the business. So typically they are very uh, conscientious of, of the resource and the dollar. So they'll do everything that they possibly can to maintain it. My example earlier with the portal, I, I, can't, I can't even remember what that cost us, but it wasn't a lot if I don't remember. So- yeah, it's interesting. I, I also think there's this trend and this may be like a broader topic, but the uh, there's there's a lot of studies that come out that more entrepreneurs are successful at the end of uh, like in their 40s and they're in like a, a bit after and they, they are definitely not, you know, hey, I'm just going to throw some stuff at the wall and see what happens. Right they're They've take they've acquired some knowledge. They're taking 
uh, in a more seasoned, calculated risk. They probably have family obligations at that stage in their life or take care of, you know, older family members, whatever it is, right? They have some obligations so and not just like they're, you know, throwing some dice and they happen to be the ones that are the most successful in the intra in entrepreneur kind of mm -hmm. universe as a founders. Uh, and that sort of is a counterintuitive finding because in the press that doesn't really come out that much. Right. So no, no. it may be the, it may be the case here that it's never too late to be that kind of, to kind of find that part of yourself. And uh, hopefully this conversation has gotten people, you know, fired up. RJ, if people want to um, learn more, you know, get, get more coaching, how do they get connect with, to connect with you? Like, I think you're, you wear two hats. So tell us about, you know, what's the best way to connect with your the easiest you know, facilitator way. hat. Yeah. The easy way is rjgrimshaw.com. That's where all that, that's the, the main point of, of all the information in terms of the contact me. If you'd like to join, we have a two groups. We have an individual entrepreneur group where you want to learn more about it and be around like-minded people sharing best practices and then the other group is we have for business owners that want to understand and learn how to deploy some of the tactics and strategies that we've talked about. And if they want to select more, then we do a full immersion courses while they're working with them. Um, it's really their choice. So we, we try and serve everyone's needs if they want to do a DYI or if they want our assistance. But that's really the two places to start to ensure that what we're teaching and coaching um, is something that you want to participate in. Amazing. RJ, thank you so much for joining and sharing your wisdom. Thanks, Alex.